Silicon Valley Bank collapsed after a massive run on the bank, and it's the largest bank failure since the 2008 financial crisis and the second largest bank failure in United States history. We're talking about a bank that had $209 billion in assets at the end of last year. But this wasn't enough to stop its shares from trading like a penny stock and plunging 60% in just one day. Even worse, the collapse of this bank was being referred to as an extinction level event for startup companies. So in the aftermath of Silicon Valley Bank's downfall, everyone is naturally wondering how this collapse happened and what might happen next. There are a lot of different aspects to the story, so I've included timestamps in the description below so you can quickly jump to different parts of the video that interest you. But I think it's most helpful to first understand how the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank happened. But in order to understand what went wrong, you first need to understand a little more about the bank's clients. Silicon Valley Bank, also known as SVB, lived up to its namesake and was in many ways the go-to bank for startup companies, particularly ones in the tech industry. Venture capital firms and the companies that made up their portfolios were the vast majority of SVB's clients, and they even described themselves as the go-to bank for venture capital investors. As a medium-sized regional bank, this unique focus and client base let Silicon Valley Bank carve out a successful niche for itself in the banking sector. Unfortunately, this strategy would also provide the groundwork for their eventual downfall, as their customer base was extremely concentrated with startup clients. But if you go back in time to 2021, the tech startup niche was an exciting place to be in. The US government at the time was providing lots of loans to businesses for pandemic relief, and the Federal Reserve was maintaining an extremely low interest rate environment as well. Since short-term interest rates were near 0% at the time, investors really couldn't get much of a return from lending, which created a heavy focus on buying equity in companies that had a lot of potential for explosive growth. The logic was that if you couldn't get much of a return on investment from lending, it made more sense to buy companies that had high growth potential over the next decade to get a return on investment that way instead. This led to a massive investment surge by venture capital into startup tech companies. If you want proof of that, look at the global dollar volume of venture capital in 2021, which reached approximately $681 billion of investment which was a massive jump from the $342 billion in 2020. This sudden surge in venture capital activity created an ideal situation for the tech startups that made up Silicon Valley Bank's client base. Investors were throwing more money at them than ever before in hopes of hitting on the next big growth company. The bottom line is that it was not hard at all for these startup companies to fund equity rounds and find somebody to buy their shares. And because of this, they were all flush with cash. So these startups went and stuck all of their excess cash they had been raising at Silicon Valley Bank as deposits. You can clearly see this in Silicon Valley Bank's earnings presentations that showcase the explosive growth in deposits at the bank from 2020 to 2021. But there was a bit of a dilemma that Silicon Valley Bank now had to face with the massive influx of customer deposits they suddenly had. SVB now had tons of cash on hand, and they needed to put that cash to work somehow so that they could make money. But the issue is that at the time, they couldn't really lend that money to make interest very easily. Lending really wasn't something their client base needed at the time, since startups already had excess cash from equity raises. There was no reason for them to seek loans, and short-term US government treasuries back in 2021 were paying virtually no interest because the Fed was maintaining a near zero interest rate environment at the time. People were buying US six month treasuries with interest yields below 0.1% for most of that year. So short term treasuries weren't really an option for Silicon Valley Bank either, because if they bought them, they wouldn't even be outpacing inflation. Instead, Silicon Valley Bank decided that in order to get a decent, safe return, they had to buy longer term investments like 10 year treasuries, which were at least offering an interest yield of around 1.5% in 2021. So what Silicon Valley Bank ended up doing is they bought tons of long term treasuries in 2021 with their influx of deposits. They didn't realize at the time that their treasury buying spree would eventually lead to significant losses and their eventual downfall. 
Things started to change in 2022 when the Federal Reserve realized that they had made a serious policy mistake by keeping interest rates near zero for so long. Inflation was running out of control in the economy and was hurting consumers and showing no signs of slowing down. So the Federal Reserve pulled a complete 180 and began raising interest rates to tighten the credit market and slow spending in the economy to slow down inflation. The Federal Reserve began an aggressive rate hiking campaign to fight inflation and took the target interest rate and federal funds rate up to 4.5% throughout 2022 and 2023. For context, interest rates have not been this high in well over a decade, as the last time the federal funds rate was this high was in 2008. This change in interest rates presented an extreme challenge for Silicon Valley Bank, as its positioning made it particularly vulnerable to interest rate increases. The first reason is the vast majority of SVB's clients are unprofitable tech startup companies that don't make enough money from operations to cover their bills. In order for these unprofitable companies to survive and hopefully grow to a point that they can become profitable, they need to fund their operations through either raising money through selling stock or by taking out loans. Unfortunately for these startups, both of these methods of raising money are much harder to do in a high interest rate environment. In the scenario where the startup pursues a loan, they'll be making much higher interest payments which can burn the business and make it even harder to make a profit as now they have regular debt payments they need to make. The other approach of selling equity to raise money is also much harder to do with higher interest rates because investors are often less interested in buying equity when higher rates exist. The reason for this is that higher interest rates create more competitive options for investors than there are in a lower rate environment. In a low interest rate environment, investors can barely make any interest through lending. So investors tend to pursue returns by targeting investments with high growth opportunity instead because there is no alternative for them. But if all of a sudden investors can make an effective annual return of 5% by buying short-term government treasuries with virtually no risk, then why invest in the risky startup that may never become profitable when you know that you have a safe 5%? So this increase in interest rates effectively led to greatly decreased interest in investing in startups and cut off a lot of these companies' access to capital. The reason that this was particularly bad for Silicon Valley Bank is that their startup-focused clients no longer could get outside investments easily, which meant that they had to start withdrawing their cash deposits to cover their expenses since they were unprofitable. Now remember though that banks use customer deposits to invest and make money. So not all customer deposits are always held at the bank in cash. They keep a certain percentage of cash on hand to meet withdrawals and customer needs, but the remainder of customer deposits might be invested in other assets like loans and treasuries. In Silicon Valley Bank's case, they were heavily invested in long-term government treasuries like I mentioned before. The problem is that they essentially bought most of these treasuries at the bond market's top in 2021 and paid high prices for treasuries with relatively low interest. When the Federal Reserve began raising interest rates, new bonds were being issued offering higher interest to investors than the ones that Silicon Valley Bank had originally bought in 2021. This meant that the price that SVB's bonds were worth on the open market was now substantially less than what they had initially bought them for, because there were now better bonds with higher interest payments available. In order to compete on the open market, Silicon Valley Bank would have to sell their older bonds at a discount to what they had originally paid for them. While SVB bought at a bad time in the bond market, they theoretically didn't have to sell the bonds and realize the loss. They would have emerged unscathed if they were able to hold the bonds to their maturity. At maturity, they would have been paid the full initial amount they had purchased the bonds for, in addition to the interest payments they had collected over time as well. The big problem is that Silicon Valley Bank was forced to sell their bonds at a loss in order to meet customer withdrawals. Their startup customers were yanking their deposits at a rate that Silicon Valley Bank could not meet with just the cash they had on hand. So they were forced to sell large parts of their treasury portfolio on the open market at a substantial loss in order to return customer deposits. Silicon Valley Bank revealed this on Wednesday, March 8th, when it attempted to launch a $1.75 billion share sale to improve its balance sheet. It revealed that it needed the funds to plug a $1.8 billion hole after the bank was forced to sell $21 billion from its bond portfolio at a loss. 
This revelation about the loss and the attempt to sell shares created a panic among the bank's clients, and they began to withdraw their deposits at an even faster rate. Big venture capital firms even called and advised their companies to pull their funds out of the bank, which effectively triggered a bank run that made it impossible for Silicon Valley Bank to cover all of the withdrawals. In the span of just 48 hours since the company attempted to sell shares, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. California regulators intervened on the morning of Friday, March 10th, and seized the bank and placed it under the receivership of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. However, the FDIC only covers deposits up to $250,000. And as a corporate-focused bank, the vast majority of deposits at SVB were above this limit and uninsured by the FDIC. As of the end of 2022, 89% of the bank's deposits were uninsured, which is a massive amount. This means only a small fraction of customer deposits were guaranteed to be returned. There were over $150 billion of deposits that were uninsured. So the million dollar question on everyone's mind is what does this collapse mean for other banks and the economy? Could this be the start of a domino effect that starts other bank failures? Obviously no one knows for sure what the future holds and how this situation will play out. But the Treasury is monitoring a few banks closely, as Janet Yellen revealed on a testimony on Friday, saying that, quote, There are recent developments that concern a few banks that I'm monitoring very carefully. And when banks experience financial losses, it is and it should be a matter of concern. End quote. So obviously there is some concern from regulators about possible contagion spreading to other banks that they are monitoring. At the same time though, Silicon Valley Bank's situation was rather unique compared to other banks. Unlike other banks, SVB's customer base was heavily centralized with unprofitable tech startups, which were especially sensitive to interest rates. This created a massive influx of deposits at the bank when interest rates were low, but led to those funds getting taken away when interest rates were high. At the same time, SVB's holdings were heavily concentrated in long-term treasuries, which also exposed them to significant interest rate risk on these investments from rising rates. When you combine all of these factors, it gave Silicon Valley Bank exceptionally high exposure to interest rate risk relative to other banks. And this was its downfall because it failed to recognize that risk and hedge against interest rates. So while some believe that there may be contagion among other smaller regional banks, the situation surrounding SVB involves many unique factors that larger banks are more protected against. The large banks are much more diversified than Silicon Valley Bank, and the reforms put into place after the 2008 financial crisis require them to pass stress testing scenarios and subject them to much more government oversight. While people are concerned about other banks, some of the most immediate impact that Silicon Valley Bank's collapse has had is on the tech startups and venture capital clients it served. Many of these companies had deposits at Silicon Valley Bank that looked like they were going to be trapped. For example, Roku disclosed that it had $487 million, or 26% of its cash and cash equivalents, held in deposits at SVB. Many other publicly traded companies were also facing potential losses in the aftermath of the collapse. And that's just from the publicly traded companies that have to disclose these events. There are countless startups and private companies that were facing large potential losses on their deposits. This led some to even go as far as to call this situation a potential extinction level event for startups. Many of the companies didn't even have access to funds to make payroll for their employees over the coming weeks, and were having to seek emergency funding to survive. People weren't left to wonder what was going to happen to customer deposits for too long though. On the evening of March 12th, the US government announced that it would be fully backing customer deposits at Silicon Valley Bank, and that they would be available Monday morning on March 13th. The Federal Reserve also announced that it was creating a lending facility for the nation's banks designed to help guard them against any financial risks caused by the collapse of SVB. Supposedly backing Silicon Valley Bank's depositors will not fall directly on taxpayers, and will instead be backstopped by a pool of money that is regularly paid into by US banks and now holds more than $100 billion. At the same time though, I don't know if I totally trust that there won't be a taxpayer burden, since it's possible that these funds may not go far enough if more banks run into trouble. While this seems like a quick fix for the situation, it may not be the best one in the long run in my opinion. 
Unfortunately, the conversation surrounding what should have happened with customer deposits is a really difficult topic to talk about because many people are biased one way or another. A lot of high-profile venture capital investors and startup founders lobbied for the government to guarantee that all customer deposits would be returned. But these people all have big financial incentives to want that since their personal wealth is linked to it. Even if they didn't deposit directly at Silicon Valley Bank themselves, they are at least invested in companies that did. So they are financially motivated to want the deposits to be fully backed so that their investments don't risk failing. On the other side of the spectrum, there are people that hate venture capital and Silicon Valley culture so much that they don't want any government assistance at all and want to leave the situation alone regardless of the effects that it could have on the rest of the economy and employees at these companies. People of this mindset are risking cutting off their nose to spite their face because contagion can very easily spread throughout the system if there is nothing done. What I'm going to share now is simply my personal opinion on the situation. While I think it's a good thing that the government has stepped in to help depositors and to calm the market, I don't know that I agree with the precedent it is setting that all deposits are fully backed. I would have preferred a middle ground option aimed to prevent further panic and contagion in the system, but that wouldn't have completely shielded companies or venture capitalists from losses. Let me be clear, it's not a good idea to randomly allow companies to fail and for many employees to lose their jobs due to the failure of their banking partner. If that precedent had been set, it could have easily destroyed confidence in smaller banks and many businesses would completely avoid keeping their assets in any banks that aren't large systemically important banks like JP Morgan, Bank of America, or Wells Fargo. A situation like that could lead to other bank runs on smaller banks, which would be terrible because if only the biggest banks are left, they become even more entrenched and systemically important to the entire economy, which would not be a good outcome. At the same time, I think it's really important to not bail out Silicon Valley Bank. SVB's shareholders and creditors are still getting wiped out. It's just the bank's customers that are being protected. But I think completely protecting the venture capital firms from loss by fully backing deposits is also a step too far. Even the individual companies that banked at SVB are not completely free from blame here. These companies could and should have mitigated their risk profile by spreading their assets between more banks, precisely so that an event like this wouldn't create an existential threat for the company and that they could continue to meet operations without interruptions through alternate accounts. I think the ideal scenario would have been if a bigger bank were to buy out Silicon Valley Bank's business and remaining assets. This would allow them to backstop the hole in SVB's balance sheet with additional assets and allow normal banking operations to resume relatively quickly for SVB's customers. Moody's Credit Rating Services estimates that depositors at SVB can likely expect a recovery rate of 80 to 90% of uninsured deposits. This means that the percentage of missing funds are relatively small and could be plugged easily by a larger bank. While there's no guarantee that a larger bank would be willing to acquire SVB, this still would be an ideal scenario if a buyer were to come forward that would provide quick relief to customers. The other alternative that I think might have been a better option compared to fully backing deposits is for the government to have quickly and clearly communicated a plan to provide quick access to a portion of customer deposits up front. If 80 to 90% of the uninsured deposits were expected to be recovered by the companies anyway, the government could have provided each company access to half of their deposits up front so that they could maintain operations and meet payroll without interruption. Then the remaining deposits could have been provided later on after regulators had additional time to figure out the remaining assets and how to handle them. To prevent more panic and other bank runs, the Federal Reserve could continue with its plan of creating a special lending facility for the nation's banks to give them access to additional liquidity to meet any withdrawals. I think an approach like this would have helped calm the panic from the aftermath of Silicon Valley Bank's collapse and prevented the bank's clients from failing while also not shielding the companies from all loss. Another interesting aspect of the story that I wanted to mention is that this situation was probably completely avoidable. Silicon Valley Bank collapsed because venture capital firms began to panic and advised their companies all to take out their money from the bank at the same time. 
If they hadn't encouraged their companies to withdraw their money from the bank all at once, it's likely that Silicon Valley Bank could have survived. It was a bank run that they created for themselves. So it's a bit ironic that many prominent venture capital investors were so vocally asking for a government guarantee that all deposits would be returned when it's a bank run that they started. But be sure to let me know your thoughts on the Silicon Valley Bank situation in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe to the channel for more finance content. Thanks.